Well, good morning and welcome to Compass. Welcome back to the 90s. Some of you are really excited about that. Others of you are like, I hated the 90s, right? Well, my name is Nate. I'm the campus pastor here at Compass North Fort Worth, and we're so glad that you're here, so glad you're worshiping with us. If you're a guest, we'd love to meet you. We'd love to connect with you, and we have a gift that we'd like to give you. It's our way of saying we're glad that you're here. So whether this is your first time or your 15th time, you've never been back there, please stop by and say hi. We'd love to connect with you that way. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, I love the 90s. We're kicking off this series today by that title, I Love the 90s. And the 90s is when I grew up. Like that was my middle school and high school years. Anybody else middle school, high school in the 90s? Yep, all right. And and so I was thinking about the 90s and and what happened in the 90s and even what I looked like in the 90s. I thought we should dust off the yearbooks and go back and show you what our staff looked like in the 90s. Now, remember this, okay? I'm the oldest one. All these other ones, they, they barely are even in elementary school at this time, okay? So take a look at this first picture. Uh, that is, that's Mish, right? That's my awesome administrative assistant. Keeps me in line. Isn't she cute there? Uh, the next one, she doesn't look like that when she's yelling at me anymore. But um, the next one, the toothless wonder here. It looks like he just went to the candy store and stole something, right? This is Anthony, our new student director, right? <laughs> Yeah, and then this next one, this is our children's director, Erica Cox. I think she might have more hair now or then than she does now, and she has a lot of hair now. Uh, this next one, that is Rob Jones, right? His hair's moved from the top of his head down here, okay? And then the final one, um, this is me, is my senior picture, right? I look like I just ate the entire McDonald's, right? So I weighed like 300 pounds in high school, seriously. Um, I like to eat a lot, and I look like, I mean, I don't even know why Amanda wanted to marry me looking like that. So it's a sweet shirt, though, that I got on there. Anyway, moving along, right? I got some more pictures I'll show you over the next couple weeks, so you got to come back. I've got some even more classic ones than that one. So now when I think about the 90s, it got me thinking about some of the things that I just loved about the 90s and and maybe some of the things that that bring back memories of things that you love about the 90s. And and so students, I know you weren't born then. You, You have to relive this whether you like it or not, okay? But in the 90s, how many of you remember TGIF on ABC, right? That was the extent of the fun at the Grella household when I was growing up. We would watch Full House with Danny Tanner and Uncle Jesse or Family Matters with the famous neighbor next door, Urkel. Did I do that, right? Um, And everybody was watching the love story take place between Corey and Topanga. And I'm pretty sure all middle school and high school boys had a crush on Topanga, right? I know I did. Uh, Or how about some of these other TV shows from the 90s that are now classics? Friends. Anybody Seinfeld fan, um, Home Improvement, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, right? Those are good shows. The 90s also brought us some classic movies. Um, I didn't want to put them all up there today. I'll probably share some of my favorite, other favorites, but, but this is my all-time classic from the 90s. That tells you everything you need to know about me. Right, this is it, right there. Uh, The 90s was also the era of boy bands, 98 Degrees, Backstreet Boys, NSYNC. We got some 98 Degrees, Nick Lachey in the house, right? Um, And then there's the Timberlake fans here. I know we got some of those, yep. Um, It also was the the era of the band called the Spice Girls, right? And then there was also this band called Hanson. Um, We were playing the song earlier, Mbop, right? Now that'll be stuck in your head all day long. And let's not forget technology that was made available in the 90s. It's when everybody started getting these bad boys. Cell phones started to become readily available. And you know, you were really cool if you had a pager in the 90s, right? <laughs> I mean, that was it. And, and of course, before an iPod, we had the disc man, and we were awesome, like walking around with those little styrofoam earmuffs, and then we had the, the disc man, all the sleeve of CDs in our backpack, right? We were really cool back in the 90s. Um, and then there was some styles that we're so glad have disappeared from the 90s, like uh, cargo pants with a tucked in polo shirt. I mean, that's just wrong. Um, how about this one, the sweater tied around your waist? Um, did any of your dads wear the Birkenstocks with the socks? I mean, hopefully that disappears forever. And then there were Air Jordans, and th- those are still in style to this day. Like, I'm rocking my Air Jordans this morning. Um, it was also famous hairstyles of that time, spiky hair, the flat top, the center part, and who can forget, ladies, the Rachel haircut, right? 
And then finally, uh, the last thing I'll talk about today from the 90s that I remember, who remembers Y2K? All right, all the students are like, what is Y2K, right? They have no clue, but remember, uh, like people were panicked. I had some neighbors who were like thinking it was like the zombie apocalypse gonna happen, so they stored up canned goods in their basement. They had the artil- you know, artillery there because if computers crashed, they were gonna be okay. And so as I think about the 90s, the 90s brings back some good memories. It also brings back some things that maybe we'd like to forget about, like that senior picture that I showed you a few minutes ago. But the 90s, the reason why we're calling this series I Love the 90s is because for those of us who lived during that time, there are things that that were core to who we were during that decade, that there were things that maybe even shaped us a little bit. And just like there were some things in the 90s that shaped us as the church, as followers of Christ, there, there are some core things about who we are that we need to talk about and we need to remind ourselves about from time to time. And so we're doing a series over the next three weeks called I Love the 90s. It's really a kind of a core value series. That we're gonna talk about who we are as a church and talk about some things that we love most from the 90s and how those can apply to our core values. So I think it's gonna be a really fun series. Now, if you're new, if this is your first time, I want you to know that I think you came at a, a good time because you get to get an idea of who we are, why we do some of the things that we do, and we're gonna talk about those things and we're gonna dive into that a little bit more. So I hope you'll come back over the next few weeks and get to know us a little bit better. But for those of us who call this place our church home, for this, those of you who are family here, I, I hope this will encourage you and challenge you to, to, to take these values to heart even more. Now, now, one of the things I loved about the 90s was um, it was the era of Michael Jordan and his Chicago Bulls teammates. And whether or not you're a basketball fan, whether or not you grew up in the 90s, everybody knows who Michael Jordan is, right? Like, I, as a kid, I wanted to be like Mike. He was the greatest basketball player to have ever lived. And I say that as a Cleveland Cavaliers fan. He's better than LeBron. There's no, hands down, all right? There's no argument in that. And and as kids, we all wanted to be like Michael Jordan, at least in my neighborhood. And so we'd go out there and we'd play the Gatorade song, right? Like Mike, if I could be like Mike, because I wanted to be like Michael Jordan. And I wanted Air Jordans. My parents wouldn't buy them for me though. So now as an adult, I buy myself my own Air Jordans, right? And I wear them because I still want to be like Michael Jordan some days. And I remember watching Michael Jordan play. And Michael Jordan... um, He played in six NBA finals, and during those six NBA finals in the 90s, he was completely dominant. And I got to witness the greatness of Michael Jordan. And you know, when you witness something that's great, when you witness something that's amazing or a feat that's just something that's incredible, you wanna let other people know, right? If you, if you have a really good meal at a restaurant, you tell people about it, or you go on a vacation, it's a, a beautiful place, you let other people know. And you know, as followers of Christ, that, that's something that Jesus calls us to do for him as well. That, that he calls us to tell others about the greatness of who he is and what he has done for each and every one of us. In the book of Acts, in Acts chapter one, verse eight, Jesus, uh, he's getting ready to ascend back into heaven. He'd been walking around on the earth for 40 days and he'd appeared to different people. And on this particular day, there's about 500 people who'd gathered together And Jesus says these words in Acts 1.8. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And really what Jesus was saying here is this. He was saying, you are to be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere that you go. That's what we've been called to as the church. That's what our job is as followers of Christ. Our job is to let other people know what Jesus has done for them, and we are to be witnesses to others. And that's why one of our core values here at Compass, the the north point of the Compass, as we like to describe it, is what we say, navigate. And it's why we say our mission here each week is navigating people to God. We say it multiple times because we believe so strongly in this core value that this is what we're supposed to do, to let other people know about what Jesus has done for them. And this isn't something that's optional. It's not, not something that Jesus says, hey, if you get a chance and you're having a conversation, maybe, maybe mention my name to somebody. No, this is a command that he gives us to do. 
Now, I don't know if you um, saw this story or not last year, but there was a, a story in an article that came out in Getty Images. There was a photographer who took this picture of this guy playing golf with a, with a volcano about to erupt behind him. And what was interesting to me about this picture is that despite the imminent danger that this guy is facing, despite the warnings that he'd been told by, by the news, and, and even what these other people on the golf course, they've all been told to evacuate, they've decided to stick around and see what happens when this volcano explodes. And you see, just like Mario Tama, there are people all around us who are in imminent danger. But sometimes they're not aware of it, or, or maybe they're aware of it, and they're just not that worried about it. And as the church, our job is to tell other people about the imminent danger that they could be facing. That's what Jesus was saying here in Acts 1.8. We are to tell other people, you are to be my witnesses of what is to come. Because the fact is this, that eternity hangs in the balance. Our lives are all at stake and it matters. And we can't, as the church, sit back and assume that, that somebody else will let them know that, that if they don't make a decision to follow Jesus with their life, they could end up spending eternity in hell. But we can't assume that people will figure it out on their own. We have to let other, other people know what they're up against. You know, Scripture, it talks about heaven and hell 54 different times. And if scripture only talked about hell once, I would believe it to be a real place where people could spend eternity. And as long as hell is a real place where people could go, is a place where people can spend eternity for the rest of their lives, then we've got to do everything that we can to be witnesses to others of what Jesus has done for them and what he can save them from. You see, for those of us who have accepted Christ into our lives, we've got good news. And this good news isn't news that we should keep to ourselves. Think about this. I mean, if you have good news, you're going to let people know. If, if you and your spouse are maybe expecting your first child, you're going to let people know that you're pregnant. That's good news. Or you get a promotion at work, you're going to let people know. That's good news. If, if you play the Powerball, and I'm not condoning that you play the Powerball, but if you play the Powerball, you're going to... Okay, you're not gonna let anybody know, right? Because you don't want them to get a cut of your money. But it's good news because you're gonna give at least 10% of what you make to Compass North Fort Worth, and we're gonna start building a building tomorrow, right? All right, okay, I mean, that's a whole nother side tangent. But, but if you get good news, what do you do? You let somebody know about it, right? You don't keep it to yourself. But here's the question I have. Why is it that we have this good news about Jesus and we tend to keep it to ourselves and we don't tell anybody. I think sometimes it's because we're afraid of rejection or we're fearful of how, how it might come out and what we might say or we just feel awkward talking about our faith around non-believers or, or maybe, I, and I hope this isn't you, but, but maybe it's because we just don't care about where other people spend eternity. I hope it's not that. I, I hope it's not because we don't care. I hope that our hearts are always thinking about those that we know in our lives who don't know Jesus and how we can help point them towards him. Carl Henry said this, he said that the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. I think this is important for us to understand. We have this good news, but we gotta make sure that it gets there in time. We, we, we shouldn't hold on to this message. Jesus calls us to be his messengers, to be intentional. And he calls us to get out of our comfort zones and let other people know about him. And look, here at Compass, this is something we're passionate about. It's why we launched two campuses in 10 weeks' time uh, just a little under two years ago. We launched North Richland Hills, and then 10 weeks later, we launched North Fort Worth. And you're sitting here today because we said we want to make sure that we can navigate as many people to God as we can in the DFW area. It's why my family and I, we moved halfway across the United States because we saw what God could do here in this area, and we wanted to be a part of that. And I share this from time to time, and this is my heart. But the reason that I do this, the reason I'm a pastor is because I want to take as many people to heaven with me one day as I can. And I hope that you do too. That we should want to do whatever it takes to reach those who are in imminent danger. And so, so here's what I want you to hear today. If, if you have already made a decision to follow Christ with your life, if you made that decision and you've chosen to follow him, then you are a found person. And what we say around here at Compass is this, is that found people, we find people. Jesus made this very clear. This was the mission of the church after he would ascend into heaven. 
is that we are to go out and to find people who are lost. I, um, Jesus, he, he had a hard time with the religious leaders of his day. Most of the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they didn't like what Jesus would do. They were, they were kind of frustrated that Jesus would hang out with um, these so-called sinners, as they, they referred to them, the, the outcasts, the lowlifes of society as they saw them. And Jesus had to set the record straight. He had, to, he had to tell them why he was doing this. And so Luke records an account of Jesus talking to the religious leaders in Luke chapter 15. And Jesus says, hey, guys, I want to, I want to tell you why I do this. And so I'll, I'll try to help you understand this by telling you three stories. And so he tells three stories. He tells the story of a, a lost sheep and a lost coin and a lost son. And the reason that Jesus talked about things that were lost is because he was trying to help them to understand that rather than looking at those that he was hanging out with and he was associating with as, as sinners, we simply need to look at them as those who are lost. And if you've walked in this place today for the first time, and maybe, maybe, maybe you have a bad experience or a bad taste in your mouth of what church is like, what I hope that you find here at Compass North Fort Worth is that this is a place where you find love and acceptance where you never feel outcast or unwanted. That, that it's never a place like, like the religious leaders would have made church out to be. Now, now, here's the thing. For those who are lost, really what that means is what? Is they're not where they're supposed to be, they're out of place, they're not being used the way that they should be. And when something's lost, it, it, the only way that it, it goes from being lost is if it gets found. It gets put back in its rightful place. It gets get used the way it's supposed to be again. And you see, in order for something to be found, it has to first be lost. And what Jesus was saying here is, and what he wanted the religious leaders to see is this, is that because of sin, because of our choices, because of the mistakes that we made, we, we all start out as lost. When Adam and Eve chose to eat from that one tree that, that God told them not to eat of, sin entered into the world. And ever since that time, we've been running away from God. And it isn't until we turn around and we head towards God, we make a decision to follow him with our life that we're no longer labeled as lost, but we become found. And Jesus said in Luke 19, 10, the reason that he came to this earth, he said this, he said, for the son of man came to seek and to save those who were lost. Jesus came to help the lost get found. He, he came to help give hope. And as the church, we're called to do the same for others. That we're to be witnesses to others of who Jesus is and what he's come to do. And look, there are a lot of people in our, our world right now who are lost and hopeless. Maybe you walked in here today and that's how you feel. Maybe you, you decided to walk through these doors today because you're like, I, I don't know where else to turn. Maybe I'll give church a try. And so you walk in here today and you feel lost and you feel hopeless. Maybe you've tried to, to find hope in a relationship and it didn't work out. Maybe you tried to find hope in a business venture or a job and those failed. Maybe, maybe you tried to find hope in obtaining wealth and possessions and that didn't work. Maybe, maybe you tried to put your hope in some substances and what you found is those things seem to keep failing you. You still feel lost. You still feel hopeless. You still feel like there's still something that's missing in your life. There's this void in your life. And what I've been praying, if that's where you're at today, if that's how you feel as you walk into this place, I've been praying for you this week. And I've been praying that, that maybe today you would hear it or maybe today that you would find that there is one who can fill that void in your life and his name is Jesus. Now, now for those of us who have been found, our job as found people is to go out and to find other people. You know, one of my favorite shows in the 90s, um, I still watch it on rerun sometimes, is the show Seinfeld. It's really a, a show about four characters. It's Jerry Seinfeld and Elaine Bennis and George Costanza and then the, the neighbor across the hallway, Cosmo Kramer. Well, in this one particular episode that, that I love, um, Cosmo, he gets lost in downtown and he doesn't know where he's at and so he calls Jerry up on the phone and I want you to listen to this conversation that takes place next. Take a look at this. Hello. You have a collect call from. Hey, buddy, don't say no. I accept. I went down to Madeline's. I told her, you got to move or it's over. Well, what happened? Well, I think it's over. <laughs> we had a big fight. She threw me out. I started walking and now I'm lost downtown. I don't have any money. I don't recognize anybody. I miss home. I don't even know how to get there. <laughs> 
<laughs> What's around you? Uh, I'm looking at Ray's Pizza. You know where that is? Is it famous Ray's? No, it's original Ray's. Famous original Ray's? It's just original, Jerry! <laughs> well, what street are you on? Okay, I'm on first and first. How can the same street intersect with itself? I must be at the nexus of the universe. <laughs> just wait there, I'll pick you up. And Kramer! Stay alive! No matter what occurs, I will find you! I think that scene's funny, but I, I love what Jerry says there. Um, he, he says, stay alive no matter what occurs, I will find you. And you see, that, that's the kind of mindset that we must have. That, that we would be like, no matter what, I'm going to go searching for those that I know in my life who are lost. Because I want to help them get found. This was the mindset of a guy named Paul. We talked about Paul a few weeks ago. But Paul, before he became Paul, his name was Saul. He wanted nothing to do with Christianity. And so he hated Christians. But, but then God turns his life around and then he becomes this bold witness. And he was trying to find everyone that he could who was lost and help them to get found. And there are some words that Paul says that I think can help us of, of how do we do this? How do we share our, our faith boldly that I wanna, I wanna look at today with the rest of the time that we have? If you have a Bible or a Bible app on your smartphone, go ahead and turn with me to Colossians chapter four. And it's in Colossians four that Paul's writing to these early Christians living in Colossae, and this is what he says, starting in verse two. He says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak about this mysterious plan concerning Christ. This is why I'm here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Now, I think that, that Paul says some things here that are really helpful when it comes to sharing boldly our faith and how do we do that. And so I'm gonna give you three things that I see in what Paul says there that I think can help us as we understand how do we do this. The, the first thing I would say is this, is sharing boldly begins with speaking to God about people. Now look at what Paul says again here in verse two. He says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. You see, prayer is the starting point of your faith. And there's power in prayer. And we, we've got to daily spend time going to God and saying, God, would you give me opportunities to share my faith with others? Would you put other people in my path? And Paul says we, we, we ought to pray that prayer to God and we ought to be thankful that we've already been found by God. And so we ought to go out and we ought to tell other people about who he is. And then Paul continues on in verses three and four. He says, he says, pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I'm here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. And notice what Paul says here. He says, pray that God would give us many opportunities. You see, as found people, we should pray for as many opportunities as possible to find other people. Paul says, the reason I'm here in prison, the reason I'm in chains is because some of the religious leaders didn't like what I was doing, but I'm okay with that. Because if, if what I'm doing is allowing other people to be released from their chains and find freedom in Christ, that's what matters most to me. And like Paul, I think we have to have that same mindset. That, that our prayers daily would be, God, give me many opportunities to speak to others about Christ. I think prayer is the most underrated tool that we have in reaching lost people for Jesus. See, prayer paves the way for a heart to be open and receptive to hear God's word. Prayer opens doors, it opens opportunities. I, I like this quote that I came across as I was studying this week. It said, the purpose of prayer is not to get man's will done in heaven, but to get God's will done on earth. God's will here on earth is that, that we as the church would help the lost to get found, to go on a search and rescue mission to find those that we know who are feeling hopeless, who are feeling broken. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus, in the Great Commission, he says these words. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus commissioned his disciples, he commissions us to go out and make sure that God's will gets done here on earth to help the lost to get found. And it starts with us, it starts with prayer. We, we pray that we'd be alert to those around us who are hurting. We, we pray for opportunities. We, we pray that we will be able to speak with boldness and clarity the message of who Jesus is to others that don't know him. Now, now the second thing that we have to understand, I think that Paul says here, when it comes to sharing boldly is this. Sharing boldly means that we speak to people about God. Notice what Paul says next in verse five. He writes, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Every day we're around those who don't know Jesus. Every day we're presented with opportunities to share God with others and we need to make the most of every opportunity. Now, now this doesn't mean we, we stand on a street corner on a crate with a, a sign in our hands that says, repent ye sinners, you're going to hell. I mean, that's probably not gonna be very effective. People probably aren't gonna want to know what we have to say. But, but here at Compass, it simply means, we, we say it, it means we get to know those around us. And there's three simple steps that we, we give. And that is, the first one is this, we demonstrate kindness. I mean, nobody wants to hang around somebody who's angry all the time, right? And that's the first step. You've, you've got to demonstrate this kindness to others. The second thing is this, you, you discover the stories of those that you're around. You get to know them. You get to know why they're hurting. You, you figure out what, what's causing them to feel brokenness in their life. And then after you've done that, then you discern next steps. And this is where we say something, we invite them to church, we do something, or we pray for them, we pray over them. You know, over the years, as a pastor, it's like, how do, how do I reach people who are far from God? Like, because I sit in an office, I'm working on messages, I'm, I'm meeting with church people a lot of the time. How do I reach those who are far from God? And one of the best ways that I found to do that is through coaching my kids' sports teams. A few years ago, I was, I was coaching our son Blake's baseball team, and, uh, and I, I had this kid on the team. His name was Anthony. He was a really good baseball player. And uh, I met Anthony, and I was like, man, this is going to be a good kid. Then I met Anthony's dad. Anthony's dad was this guy named Rich. And Rich was this big, bald, uh, goatee Italian dude who I knew, like if I messed up his kid's baseball career, he was going to pound my face in, right? And I was scared to death of Rich. But as the season went on, Rich and I got to know each other. We, we started to talk after practices and after games. And, and one day after a game was over, we're standing, and I'll never forget this, we're standing at, at the center field fence and we're watching another game and Rich starts asking me questions about God. And as he's asking those questions, uh, I, I was like, man, here's my opportunity. Hey, Rich, would you like to come to church? I, I think it'd be great. And he said, you know what? I'll think about it. We'll see if we could check it out. Well, Rich didn't show up to church that Sunday. And we saw each other from time to time. The season ended and Rich and his family, I would keep inviting them, but they just never showed up. Then one day, when I least expected it, Rich walked through the doors of the church. As the service went on, Rich was moved by everything that he heard and at the end of the service, Rich came to me in tears. And he said, that message is exactly what I needed to hear. From that point on, I started seeing Rich and his family show up week in and week out. Now, it didn't happen overnight. But over time, conversations that I had with Rich and probably Rich had with other people caused Rich to turn to God. And for those of us who are followers of Christ, we have to understand that every day we encounter people in our lives who are just like rich, who are lost, who are feeling hopeless, who are in need of a savior. And like Paul says here, we need to live wisely among them and we need to make the most of every opportunity that we have. Look at what Paul says at the very end of verse six here. He says, let your conversations always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Now, Paul says our conversation should always point people towards Jesus and never have them turn their back on him. That we need to make sure that, that Paul says, he says we need to make sure that our conversations are seasoned with salt. I like this imagery. You know, the things that we say and the way that we act should reflect God in a positive way and it should leave a good taste in the mind of those that we're talking to. Now, there's one last thing that I want to share with you when it comes to sharing boldly your faith that Paul says here in these verses, and that is this. Sharing boldly means that we never stop. 
See, I think a lot of times we think, well, I met my quota. I, I invited a few people and a few of them came and I'm done. It's somebody else's turn. But we can never become complacent. We can never stop telling other people about Jesus. Several years ago, there was a book that came out. That, the title of it was The One Thing That You Can't Do in Heaven. And the premise of this book was really this. When, when we get to heaven... We can't share our faith with unbelievers anymore. It's too late. And so while we're here on this earth, we need to make the most of every opportunity that we have and tell other people about Jesus. I don't know if there was anyone that was better at doing this in the New Testament than Paul. Everywhere Paul went, he told people about Jesus and he would even admit, he's like, I don't care if I spend time in prison. I don't care if I'm beat up. I don't care if I get shipwrecked. I don't care. I just want people to know who Jesus is. There's an account in Acts where, where Paul and Barnabas, they, they go to this town called Pisidian Antioch and, and Paul and Barnabas go into the synagogue there and, and when they walk in, Paul's asked to share a little bit with the people. And so Paul begins to talk and he talks about how God moved through certain people in the Old Testament. But then Paul turns the corner and he switches to Jesus. In Acts chapter 13, this is where the story takes place. In verse 32, this is what Paul says. He says, and now we are here to bring you this good news. He's like, look, I've got good news for you and I want you to hear it. And then he goes on to say this in verse 38. He says, brothers, listen, we are here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness of your sins. Everyone who believes in him is declared right with God. When Paul finished, it says that people begged Paul to come back the next week. And so Paul and Barnabas, they agreed to stay around. The next week, they come back. In verse 44, we read this. It says, on the next Sabbath day, almost the entire city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Now, now here's why I tell you this story and why I think it's so important. On that first Sunday that Paul and Barnabas were there, there was about 200 people in the synagogue. In between that week and the next, it says that the entire city of Pisidian Antioch shows up. You know how many people lived there during that time? 50,000 people. In one week's time, it went from 200 to 50,000 people. Can you imagine what that must have been like on that day? And they were like, the ushers were like, where are we gonna put everybody, right? We gotta run out the Coliseum, right? Can you imagine? And, and, and the way it happened is this, 200 people said, you know what? We're gonna tell people about Jesus and what Jesus has done. And so they started inviting, and I did a little math, quick calculation. That means that each one told 250 people and they brought them all along with them. You know, every Sunday here at Compass North Fort Worth, between our, our two services, our kids and students, we have between 400 to 450 who have been attending, which is awesome for an 18 month old church. Can, can you imagine though what would happen if we all got really serious about telling other people about Jesus? And we started sharing that. Can, can you imagine if we, if we each told 250 people and brought them along, we could reach this entire region for Christ. And I don't know about you, but wouldn't that be amazing? I was thinking about that. I, I would love to see that there were so many people here that we wouldn't have enough chairs for everybody. I know our kids, uh, kids department would hate it, but I would love it if there were so many kids that we had to open up, not just the blue gym, the green gym, the main gym, and we had to open up the indoor practice football facility for all the kids that were here, right? Wouldn't that be amazing? It'd be glorious chaos. Kids would be running around and we just have to like tie them down probably, right? Just to keep them all in control. But wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be amazing if every parking spot in this entire place was filled because people invited someone they know and they came? Wouldn't it just be crazy if one week we just showed up and there wasn't enough room for everyone who came? You know, that's my prayer. That's my prayer for our church is that we would continue to navigate thousands of people to God. For some of you, you received an email from me this week that if you're a regular attender or a member, I, I sent this out too. And I just said, I, I want you to pray with me about this. And I, I just feel like God's placed it on my heart that, that by the end of the year, I wanna see a thousand people here on a Sunday. That, that means more than double what we have right now. The only way that happens though is if we tell other people about Jesus and we invite them here. So this week, I, I wanna encourage you to be bold and to share your faith with someone that you know needs to hear it.
This week, I want, to, I want you to pray that prayer that Paul says, God, give me many opportunities to tell other people about who Jesus is. And this week, I want to challenge you to invite someone and bring them with you next week to Compass North Fort Worth. You know, one of the things I love about the 90s was it's when I got my first cell phone. I'll never forget it. It was, an, it was a Motorola Star Trek phone. It was the flip phone. Anybody else have one of those? I mean, I had the little antenna. I thought I was all that with that thing, right? Now, cell phone, I mean, this thing, we use it for everything in an instant. We've got apps on our phone. We can send text messages. We can, we can snap someone. We can Marco Polo. We can do all kinds of different things on our phone that allows us to get a message out quickly. What if this week we actually just took this the little device and we invited someone we knew to be a part of what's happening here at Compass North Fort Worth. In fact, we're gonna close out uh, today and we're gonna sing a song here in just a second. And and I'm gonna challenge you. For those of you who have been found, our job is to find people. And so as we sing this song, I want you to think about that one person you know and you wish was sitting next to you right now. And while we're playing this song, which I, I want this song to be an anthem, reminding us of God's goodness to us and that we need to share that goodness with others. And as you think about that person, I wanna, I wanna challenge you, just invite them right now and go, hey, I'm at church right now. My pastor just said, would you, would you be willing to invite someone you know? I would love for you to come with me next week. And that simple invitation could change everything for a person. And it simply starts with us being willing to be the witnesses that Jesus has called us to be. So this week, who is it that you know is in imminent danger? Who is it that you know needs to be found? Who is it that you need to share the goodness of God with? I wanna challenge you as found people to find people. So we're gonna sing this song and and may this be a cry that we share the goodness of God with others. I also want this to be a time, maybe there's someone here. We know we've got a few baptisms again this week and, and we've said we'll keep bringing the tank every single week if there are those who are lost who wanna be found. And maybe you're here today and you need to take that step in your life. You're like, I don't wanna feel lost and hopeless anymore. And we wanna give you that chance today. So as we sing this song, you can come to the front, tell myself or Anthony, we'd love to talk to you about that. We've got everything ready. We've got shirts, t-shirts, towels. We could do it today. So would you just stand with us as we sing this song and may this song be an anthem for you today.